Um, our first speaker is David Ackley, Indefinite Scalability for Living Computation. Thanks, David. Uh, can, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. I'd rather bellow than uh, uh, put on the mic. Um, I guess the first AI conference I went to was AAAI 82, the second national conference on AI in Pittsburgh. This is quite different here. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's uh, a lot of things have changed. We were all excited about the Motorola 68000 running at 10 whole megahertz. All right. Uh, um, and, but a lot of things haven't changed. And in particular, we're still programming the same kind of machines, the same kind of ways that we did uh, um, at the time. And I think we're going to need to uh, to change that sooner rather than later. I can't tell if this is on or not. Uh, um, here we go. Okay, something? All right. Yeah, um, so, uh, if you want to follow along, the paper uh, is at animate.us slash blue. Uh, um, other than that, I'm just going to rush through and try to get to as much as I can in the time that we have. History says I run rather long, so it would be wise to start at the end. Uh, so I start with the conclusions, uh, uh, and here they are. Uh, um, for scalable systems, for computer systems that can grow much larger than the systems we have today, and for systems that can make a credible case for computer security, both the regular computers we have today and the terrifying internet of unsecurable things that is coming now, uh, uh, we need society to push us in the computing industries to focus on robustness. Uh, and I suggest to you, this is the blue sky idea, that to get to serious robustness, we're going to have to give up on hardware determinism. We're going to have to give up on saying same input, same output. If that isn't terrifying, you don't program enough. But the suggestion is, the happy news that I hope to leave you with, is that there is life after hardware determinism. It just means that software has to carry some of the load of responsibility that we have been saying reliability is a hardware problem. It is no longer. And the suggestion is, is that we focus on this idea of best effort computing. We are going to be admitting that our programs may give the wrong answer. Our programs may be incorrect. But you'll still prefer that to something that pretends to be correct and fails catastrophically when you blink at it, let alone when malware gets to it uh, and other attacks. Other, whoa, uh, um, other <coughs> to get to that stage where we have to take this bitter pill of saying software, which has focused only on correctness and efficiency for 50 years, and is now going to have to actually focus on reliability in effective use of redundancy and something more than just blind efficiency. We can drive that by saying we need computer architectures that are indefinitely scalable. We need computer <coughs> architectures that we can just plug more and more and more and more together. And it will be so big that parts that will always be failing. It will be so big that we will be using it before we have finished building it. To program on that level of architecture, you have to face, face issues of robustness. You have to face issues of asynchronous interactions. You have to face all the issues of races and the stuff that we tend to avoid in small systems. And linking to Tom Dietrich's uh, great presidential talk yesterday, uh, uh, where we have to deal with robust AI facing the unknown unknowns, I want to suggest to you that this approach indefinite scalability is going to suggest a way that we can actually bound the unknownness of the unknown, which from one point of view seems obviously impossible, but which from another point of view is completely trivial, and we'll hope to get to it. All right, so here was, here was Tom's talk yesterday. Uh, uh, 
I, I couldn't agree more. The, the need for robust AI, yes, absolutely. High stakes applications where we are giving increasing responsibility to closed loop interactions by systems that are software and programming and that are just as crappy as all the other software and programming that we know we make is driving the need for something new. Uh, he suggests uh, lessons from biology as one of the responses to it. That's what I want to concentrate on that we're actually using in the approach that I'm doing. So <clears throat> this is a blue sky talk. The blue sky is, is that we will soon be ready to embrace moving beyond determinism and programming. But that doesn't mean we haven't done any work. Uh, we've been working on this for several years. And so I want to start with a, a demo uh, and show you sort of a little bit of what we've done. Um, this is a simulator for an indefinitely scalable computer architecture. This is actually four tiles. It's a little hard to see, uh, but uh, they're that are cooperatively connected at the edges. And what I would like to do is do a quick demo and also have it be sort of a metaphor for technology in, in human development. Okay, Let's see if I can do both at once. So what I want to do first, whoops, is. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to draw a square. I'm trying to draw a box. All right, so there's a box. There's a great box. Uh, uh, the important point about this box is it has an inside and an outside. So we can differentiate space and put something inside it and then do something different conceivably than it's outside it. Okay, in the metaphor, I suggest to you, this is human technology from zero to the Industrial Revolution. Making stuff by hand. Uh, uh, to build tools and store things and move things, okay? And that's great, and it worked fine, we did great. The Industrial Revolution took us to a whole other level where we could automate processes that had been done manually, and now we get much higher quality, much lower cost, and we can knock out as many boxes as we like. And this is the Industrial Revolution, I salute to you. Now, it's still true that once we've made these things, if we get the eraser tool up here to kind of simulate the passage of time, you know, they sort of all gradually suffer the slings and arrows of fortune and they gradually fall apart, but that's okay. They're easy and cheap to make and we're great. What I suggest to you is we are moving into a post-industrial manufacturing framework that we're just beginning to understand. And here's my metaphor for it. Uh, um, whoops, we put the pencil back. Uh, this guy get the eraser going again. He doesn't really erase very well. Should we get a bigger, bigger gun in here? So you can see what's happening. This thing is not just a fire and forget build at once box. This is a thing that knows it wants to be a box. It knows what it means to be a box and it heals and repairs itself as it goes along. This is, I submit to you, a living computation in a fundamentally real sense, more so than most of the systems that we have built today. Okay, so I can actually, if I get good at this, uh, these guys are, are hard to kill. Uh, uh, give me a bigger bug. Uh, uh, okay, I killed one. You get the idea, all right? So the suggestion is, how does this sort of thing work? How do we get from a passive, do something once to an automatic, self-healing, self-aware, uh, self-aware makes that's too strong, but in a very limited way, a very small way, each individual piece of this thing knows that, well, so this is a, a source code for not a whole box, but just a line, a 16 segment line. And it has three, well, it has several key aspects of it. Ports I want to focus on is this thing MPOS, it's a data member, it's a four bit unsigned value that says where I am in the line segment. And when it's my turn to do something, I have an, my behave function gets called automatically, and I check to see is my number the smallest number? No. Is the guy in space west of me empty? Yes. Reproduce. These three lines, completely humble, make a copy of myself, decrement the pointer, the position in the copy, and store it to my west, is how the healing and the constructing works. Same thing if I'm not at the maximum position and to my west is available, make it there, all right? This is a program in the language Ulam, which we have developed specifically to study how to program in this indefinitely scalable, living computation, robust first approach. It's got 
uh, packages for Ubuntu 1204 and 1404 you can install and play with today. Uh, uh, if you're willing to install from a personal package archive, which is a little sketchy. So, we have our metaphor. I suggest that the future is these living systems that take care of themselves. How can we make a box that takes care of itself? We have to give information about the global needs uh, of the computation, ramify down and down and down and down until individual guys can do something to make things better. And in this case, he can fill empty spots that should be part of the box. All right? And that's the essential difference between traditional top-down uh, serial deterministic computation where everything gets done with no purpose in mind, it gets done efficiently, it gets done once, relying on the perfect stability of RAM, relying on the fact that memory once written can be relied on forever. Living systems don't do that. They rebuild themselves continually as needed, and we can afford to do that. We can take this sort of stuff and then we can make it much more efficient once we know what we want. We are at a new research era to figure out how to do stuff with this and not have the whole thing melt down with fork bombs and crazy cans. All right. So in the remaining six and a half minutes, uh, um, I would like to <coughs> try to paint a picture of the, where we're going from, where we're going to a little bit more, uh, and then circle back around to one more little demo to finish up, okay? Uh, um, I show this slide pretty much in all of my talks. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. The point of us for us today is just that there are two very different approaches to doing computation. And the one that we have spent most of our time, although AI, more than many disciplines within computing, has made some forays into the other column, are still very heavily on the finite scalability algorithm begin and end, where in order to even talk about it, it's supposed to be correct. And then once it's correct, the goal is to be as efficient as possible and as robust as necessary. Robust is the last thing that you do. If it actually crashes, you go back and robustify it until it doesn't, and then you ship. Or you already shipped, and then you fix it later. The alternate approach is rather than saying the goal is to finish as quickly as possible, the goal is to survive no matter what. To have ongoing processing where robustness, the ability to give some kind of answer and to keep on processing, is goal number one. And then, yes, given that we're going to stay alive and do something, we're going to try to be correct. But we're not going to pretend that correctness is an admissibility requirement. I mean, what is correctness for a Google search? I mean, most software today cannot be correct or incorrect. It hasn't got a spec. So we're kind of living in the emperor's new clothes. Uh, but we've been here for a long time. All of these other things, uh, the fact that it's not going to be centralized, and rather than doing logical inferences to think of what's happening, well, if x is greater than x, we're going to be doing statistical inferences, saying the odds of that this thing going this way are less than or so I'm going to ignore it, and so on. And then fundamentally, the response to error is completely different. Tom Dietrich's talk mentioned Minsky saying about how programs will typically crash if they get anything unexpected, as if this was surprising. But no, I mean, we design machines to do that. That's the whole point. Because we have given not a second thought to what the program should do if the if statement goes the wrong way. What would we even begin to say? Whereas in the indefinite scalability, we're going to hide errors and heal as best we can. And it leads to a very different view, the sort of master of the universe, you do what you're told, don't ask why, versus everybody is empowered to try to make the world a better place. That is the robust first approach. You have to figure out how to take a complex global problem and break it down into tiny little consequences so that a locally situated agent, looking at what it is, can make a just case for saying, well, I'm a part of a sorting guy. We all agree that big numbers go up and small numbers go down. This number is bigger than the one I just saw. I'm gonna move it up. And it just doesn't. Make the world a better place 
and then get enough people, enough agents, enough things, enough sites in there, and the job gets done. That's the approach to computation. All right. Oh, yeah. And then this is the advocacy part of the talk. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we have been mining the traditional serial deterministic tracker for 60 years, and it's been great. It's also been terrible. And there is a fundamental sense in which serial determinism, where you say, I'm going to be all efficient, I'll never do anything twice, that makes no sense. The answer has to come out the same way is fundamentally unsecurable. It's not that computer security is just we hadn't focused on it yet. Because we design computers to be universally programmable, ooh, that's great. That also means they are completely unpredictable when one error occurs. If we can adversarially choose a single bit flip, we can take a machine that's doing anything and make it do anything else and then we're putting it in control of the flapperons on the 787 and so forth. Uh, uh, okay. We're in crazy land. Taking machines like this, deterministic machines that have no clue, that independent components of it have no clue what they're doing, and giving them increasing ballistic, financial, chemical responsibilities in the real world. Okay, almost out of time. Uh, um, all right, I already ranted about this. This is more about our particular approach to indefinite scalability. The idea is you make a hardware tile. How do you make a computer that's indefinitely big? You make a tile that can be plugged into copies of itself and they're completely fungible and you make as many as you can afford. And that's what we've done. There's a picture of the first round hardware that we did back in 2009, uh, hoping to do a second round hardware uh, this coming year uh, if things come together. The fact that these are independent tiles with independent CPUs means that there is no global clock. There cannot be any global clock. These tiles are racing against each other. When one of them finishes an event, it starts another event. That means it might get two before the other guy gets one. Deal with it. This is the ground rules for indefinite scalability. Okay? And, and I'll skip that stuff. And let's go back. So now the idea is, you know, people, I, I give this talk and people, you know, nod. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, maybe, but no, no I'm not going to work on that. Uh, um, and, and I understand. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to swallow. But uh, uh, you can do things with it that are really not too bad. Uh, and let's see if I can. All right, here we go. And I will stop and I'll put this up here and then I'll stop and take a couple of questions because really we're out of time. Uh, um, this is a toy four-port data switch. Uh, it's got colors, red, green, yellow, and blue on the side, which are the ports. They're injecting data cells, each of which is carrying a four-byte packet uh, that is destined for a random other site. At the moment, they're just vibrating around, diffusing, and going basically nowhere, but there is a... Oh, let's get a better background here. Uh, uh, there is a... Uh, there we go. Uh, there is a routing grid, the dark dots that you may be able to see, that is growing spontaneously as part of the machine's operation that is now gradually saying when it sees a port, it starts gossiping to its neighbors about distances. The red port is this way, the green port is that way. And then the data cells use the information in the gradients on the routers to get where they're going. And as this thing finishes up, it'll gradually clear out all this backup data log and process fairly well. And it'll do so in this ridiculously robust way. I mean, we can, we can blow giant holes in this thing. Uh, um, and will it survive? Well, sure, it'll survive. Why will it survive? It will survive because it just rebuilds itself the same thing it did at the start. So I'm out of time. Uh, the, uh, the goal is robust systems. I hope I piqued your interest. There's much more stuff on the web. Thank you very much. Thank you.